You are Yahweh, Jehovah God. We thank you that you are the one through all the storms of life that we go through, have a hold on us and will never let us go, even though we will let you go numerous times. But you have that grip on us that can never relax nor release, but will bring us safely home one day. So, Father, we ask as we look into your word today, as we're still on that journey on earth to the promised land that you have for us, that you will instruct us and teach us, especially as we look at what the normal Christian life looks like. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, you know, for... Most of my life, I've been an avid reader. Um, People have come into the office, my office, have asked me, have you read all those books? And I say, yeah, pretty much. And they're saying, wow. And they say, where do you find the time? I say, I don't watch TV. (laughs) I've got lots of time. And uh, anyway, I'm an avid reader, and, and I especially love to read biographies of Christians who have dreamed big dreams of serving God, taking great risks for the kingdom and the glory of God, have seen God do unbelievable things in their lives and have suffered for the sake of the gospel. I love those kinds of true stories about believers who have apparently risked it all for the sake of God's glory. And I I find those stories to be inspiring and faith-strengthening, but I have also found sometimes those stories to be unrealistic. In the sense that they, if the authors are not careful, can at times present a one-sided picture of a person and thus distort who that person really was, perhaps when nobody was looking. I mean, sometimes you can read books about famous Christians and you get the idea that they never struggled in their walk with God, never doubted, never sinned, and never needed to repent. They come across sometimes as the superheroes who fly faster than speeding bullets, are more powerful than locomotives, and can jump tall buildings in a single bound. I mean, sometimes that's how these Christians come across. When in reality... They all struggled, just like we do, to live a normal Christian life. And so that's one of the things that I love about the Bible. The Bible doesn't present biblical characters. It doesn't present the biblical characters that we read about as anything other than who and what they were. Normal, imperfect, faltering, and yes, sinful human beings who needed a perfect Savior. And and I find this refreshing because I am most helped and best encouraged by those kinds of people the Bible presents to us as righteous sinners. Righteous sinners. You see, in Christ you are righteous. God sees you as righteous. You have the righteousness of Christ enveloping you. And yet, in your experience, you and I, we still sin. So we are, as the Bible calls us, righteous sinners. We are righteous as God sees us, and yet we still are struggling with sin. So the Bible presents its characters and us as believers who all the while in love with Jesus are still struggling with loving their sin too. Believers who falter in their obedience to God, their trust in God, and their devotion to God. But believers who also, when they sin, repent. And through their imperfect lives prove that the only hero in the Bible and the only hero in all of our lives is Jesus. The rest of us are normal. We're just normal. So today we're going to look in Genesis chapter 11, verse 31, all the way through Genesis 13, verse 4, at Abraham, who we saw last time I was here, was called the friend of God. That was a couple weeks ago. And what we're going to see is that this friend of God, this man named Abraham, was a normal Christian, a normal believer, a normal follower of God. Now, If you remember, God, way back in Genesis 1 and 2, creates the first couple, Adam and Eve. 
And he creates them to have dominion over the earth, and he tells them to fill the earth. And to fill the earth primarily with people who are going to love God and love each other. That was the creation mandate. But Adam and Eve failed to do that because of their disobedience to God in Genesis chapter 3. Well, then later in Genesis 9-1, God raises up another couple, Noah and Mrs. Noah. And, and he gives them the same commission. After the flood and they are on dry land, he says to them, fill the earth. Replenish the earth. Fill it. And the idea is fill the earth with people who will love God and each other. But Noah and Mrs. Noah and their descendants fail, just like Adam and Eve. And then we come to Genesis 12, 1 through 3, where God raises up another couple, Abraham and Sarah. Essentially, another Adam and Eve, if you will, to populate the earth with people who will love God and love each other. And the way God uses Abraham and Sarah to do that is by using them to bring the promised one into the world as well as the promised one's people who are going to be used by God to finish this great job of blessing every people group in the world by giving them the Savior and the gospel. So, so the couple which finally is going to fulfill God's purpose in the creation mandate of filling the earth with people who love God and each other is not going to be Abraham and Sarah. It's not going to be Noah and Mrs. Noah. It's not going to be Adam and Eve. Do you know who that couple will be who's going to be the blessing to the entire earth, who has taken the gospel to the entire earth, who has filled the earth with people who love God and love each other? It's going to be none other than Jesus and his bride the church. So all of these couples are pointing to that ultimate couple, Jesus the promised one and his bride, the church, who was given the great commission to go into all the people groups of the world and make disciples, that means see them converted, see them come to Christ, and then baptize them, and then teach them what Jesus had commanded. And so here we are as the local church. We are a picture of the universal church, the bride of Christ. We are that last couple. And our groom is Jesus himself, the promised one. So you see Genesis 12 is a very important passage here, pivotal passage, as we start to now make a turn into the rest of the Bible, as God is just beginning to just develop this story more and more for us to enjoy and understand and, and profit from. And what's really important here, though, is that he uses a normal, ordinary man and his wife to bring about his eternal plan to fill the earth with people who will love him and love each other. Just normal. Now, what we want to do, though, is we, we want to see how, how God uses this man and we want to see what his normal life looked like as a follower of God. But before we do that, we need to understand when and really how Abraham trusted in God for salvation. And what that fledgling, normal, saving faith looked like. Now, now, now if you're a Bible scholar, if you've been to seminary, if you've been to Bible college, if, if you've listened to a lot of guys on, on, on the internet, solid guys what you're probably going to think is that Abraham came to saving faith in God in Genesis 15, verses 5 through 6, where we read that God took Abraham outside and he said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. It's because he's, he's told Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the heavens. So he said, Come on outside and see if you can count all those stars. He says, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And then the, the verse 6 says, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord credited it to Abraham as righteousness. In other words, Abraham demonstrated faith in God's promise, and because he had faith in God, believed in God, believed in God's promise, received God's promise, the Bible says that God reckoned it to him as righteousness. He declared him righteous. 
But, but there's something there that a lot of these scholars miss. And it's a verb tense. And it's in the phrase, Abraham believed the Lord. See, the verb tense that's used in Hebrew is not talking about Abraham believing the Lord right then. This is a perfect vav tense. And the idea is that it's talking about a belief that started sometime earlier. A belief that started before he got to Genesis 15. And Genesis 15 is just confirming that belief that God saw and counted it as salvation. And so what is pointing us back to is Genesis 12. Because it's in Genesis 12 that Abraham, when he's known as Abram back there, but I'm just going to keep calling him Abraham because it's easier for me to say Abraham. It's back in Genesis 12 that Abraham gets saved. When he receives God's promise and believes God's promise and places faith in God's promise, and that's the faith that God saw and then counted Abraham as righteous. And then he saw it again in Genesis 15. He sees it again all through Abraham's life, and it confirms his original faith in God. Okay? So, Abraham, back when he was Abram, was living in Ur of the Chaldees. We looked at that a couple weeks. That's in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. And God came to Abram, and he called him to leave his country, leave his family, leave everything that was familiar to him, and go to a land that God was going to show him, even though he had no idea where that land might be. And the Bible tells us that Abraham believed this God who has now just introduced himself to Abraham and he obeys and he follows God and he goes to this land. So when you look at Acts 7, 2 through 4 and you look at Hebrews eleven eight, 8 and you can look at those on your own, Acts 7, 2 through 4 and Hebrews eleven eight, 8, the Bible tells us that when God calls Abraham to leave his old country and go to the land he's going to show him, that Abraham responds in faith. That means he believes God, he obeys God, and he goes. That means that he receives God's promise as his own. And you know, that's what you have to do in salvation. Salvation is always based on faith in what God says. God tells us we have to have faith in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ, who came to earth and went to the cross on our behalf and died for our sins, was buried and rose again, 1 Corinthians 15. That's where the gospel is explained. And we take those events, and we don't give mere mental assent to those events. Satan knows that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, and he's not saved, okay? He knows that happened. But when you take those events and you understand what those events mean and what Jesus did and who Jesus was, and you take that and you make that your, you, you receive the promise of eternal life through Christ, who has said that if you will come to him for salvation, he will indeed save you and forgive you of your sins. That's the faith that's required to believe and be saved. We receive God's promises as our own. And we trust in them. Well, that's what Abraham does. And he acts upon the promise that God gives him, and he obeys God's command to leave Ur of the Chaldees and follow the Lord, and thus he becomes a believer. He becomes a follower of God. His walk with the Lord essentially begins. But his walk with the Lord, just like his initial faith in the Lord, is not perfect, nor is it pretty. It's not pretty at all. But it was normal. And it reminds me a lot of our walk with the Lord. And, and hopefully this message will encourage the rest of us whose saving faith is normal too. My intent in this message is not to go through Abraham's life here in Genesis 12 and find out everything that's wrong and try to tell you what he should have done to make it right. What I want you to see today is everything that was wrong and understand that that's normal. And that just may encourage us when we see those things happen in our life, to understand that normal Christian life doesn't look like this. Certainly doesn't look like this. 
it looks like this. Right? And that's normal. So what do normal Christians look like and do? So let's go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 31. We're going to start there. Number one, and I'm just going to give you five, five points here. I don't ever write them down in your inserts because I think it's good for everybody else to write them. If I had to write them, you should write them too. That's how you remember them. Number one, it is normal for Christians who want to obey God to struggle with putting God first. It is normal for Christians who want to obey God to struggle with putting God first. That is normal. So you look at Genesis eleven thirty one, and we start the story of Abraham here in the Bible, and it starts with his father. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together, that's a key word, together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, this is a different name than his son's name, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and he died in Haran. So, so according to Genesis 11.31, through the end of that chapter... After Abraham's saving encounter with God, we find him in what is now southern Turkey. That's where Haran is, southern Turkey, along with his father Terah and the rest of the family. But, but this was not exactly what God told him to do. This is not the picture that God had in mind, okay? Uh, this was not supposed to be the way it was. And we get a hint of that in the verse verse of chapter 12. Look at chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said. So if you've, if you've got a version that are more literal, that's the way it's going to say that. The Lord had said to Abram, what? Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Well, what's wrong with this picture? Well, Abram was supposed to have left his father and his family. He was supposed to have gone with Sarah and he was supposed to have gone to the land of Canaan, not southern Turkey. So, so, so what happened? What happened? I mean, Abraham believes and he obeys God by leaving his country. He starts for Canaan, but he did not exactly leave all his family behind or get to Canaan, but he does get close. And, and rather, what, what happens is that he has a partial obedience. Now, he believes God. He really does believe God, just like we believe God. But when it came to actually doing what God said, his obedience was partial. It was not complete. It was not perfect. And I dare say none of ours is either, is it? So he ends up in the wrong place. He's close to where he should be. He's, he's a few hundred miles north. But he's there with all the wrong people. And so he ends up in another city called Haran. And he's there until his father dies. And somewhere in the process, Abram, who was supposed to be going and following God on his own, his father wants to go. Or he wants his father to go, and his father takes the lead because it said in 1131 that his father took them there. God never gave Terah the command. He gave the command to Abraham. But somewhere along the line, Abraham gave up his authority, his spiritual authority, because for some reason he was unwilling to leave his family and follow God. And we're going to see something about that in just a minute. Once his dad dies, Abraham now is ready to go south to Canaan. And he gets everybody together. He's, he's about to depart, but he makes the same mistake again. Because if you look down, and we'll read chapter 12 down through verse 6. It says, The Lord said to, had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. 
and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him. So now he's leaving Haran. He's about to head down to Canaan. He's going to obey the Lord fully this time. And look there, and Lot went with him. That's a no-no. That's his father's household. Abraham does it again. He does it again. You want to talk about a besetting sinner? This is Abraham. Anybody identify with besetting sins? You do it once, you're never going to do it again. Two weeks later, you do it again. Not going to do it again. Three weeks later, you do it again. Well, here's Abraham. He's struggling with saying to his family, I need to leave you to pursue the will of God for my life. So he takes Lot with him. Abram's 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Apparently, Abraham seems to be having a problem with the part of God's will that says, put me before your family. I'm number one. Can we understand that struggle? I tell you, one of the most heartbreaking things, in fact, this probably is the most heartbreaking thing that Nancy and I have ever had to do as a married couple was when we went to Africa and God called us to go to Africa and we were very sure of that call. And yet we we left three of our older children at home. Now they were already out of the home. You know, um, they had been in the military and a couple were still in the military. Luke and Sarah were still in the military. Mark had, had already served his time and was in school. But, you know, when, when we went to the airport with the other four with us, you know, we had Bethany and Rachel and Esther and Peter. And we were at the airport, and we had to say goodbye, though, to the other three. That was heartbreaking. You know, we're, we're designed to have our kids leave us, right? But we're not designed for us to leave our kids. And, and, and so that was a heartbreaking thing. But we knew God was calling us to do that. And, and, and to, it would be disobedience not to go just because we couldn't say goodbye. There's lots of people who don't serve the Lord today because they just can't say goodbye to their family. They, they, they can't say goodbye to their lands. They can't say goodbye to their houses. They can't say goodbye to their comforts. They can't say goodbye to their conveniences. In other words, God is not first. And Abraham's having a problem here. And it's a besetting sin, and it's a recurring problem, and it's causing Abraham problems because it's delayed him up in this place in southern Turkey for a long time until his father finally dies. And I wonder if he hadn't taken his father along, if his father would have lived a lot longer back in Ur of the Chaldees. Because finally God's got to take him so that Abraham will finally go. That gives us something to think about, doesn't it? But then again, he does it with Lot, too. And and we understand the difficulty in leaving loved ones behind to pursue God's will for your life because it's a normal struggle to have. Now, now maybe it's not physically leaving, but maybe you've got a loved one that is, is just, you know, they're just not living for the Lord at all. But it's gotten to a point where they're not only not living for the Lord, they they are actually an influence perhaps in your home or in your lives, in whatever... That is detrimental. And you've had to be in that position where you've actually had to say to a loved one, could be any loved one, you're going to have to go. Now that probably is more heartbreaking than anything I could ever imagine. You've had to exercise tough love, whatever that might look like in your case. And to not exercise that tough love would have been to just let that person go on their merry way to eternal destruction. And God's calling you or has called you to make that very difficult and heart-wrenching decision to say you need to exercise tough love in that person's life. And that may 
cause separation. That's hard. See, Abraham's having a struggle here, putting God first. And God keeps pressing Abraham on this issue. All through these chapters, Abraham is being pressed on this one issue. This is a big issue for him. He can't cut the apron strings with his family members. And then finally, in Genesis 22, what's God say to Abraham? I want your son. Now this will help you understand the story of Isaac just a little bit better. Abraham has a history of putting his family members above God. And so God says in Genesis 22, I want your son. Who's more important to you, me or your only son? And what's Abraham do? Well, we see tremendous growth in his life because he believes that he can trust God with his son's life. And he believes that even if he does go through with what God says and sacrifices his son, somehow God is going to stop that or God is going to resurrect him back to life. He believes that. In other words, you know what Abraham has learned by Genesis 22? I can trust God with my family, no matter what God wants. Now, we all have to come to that point sometime, don't we? Listen, we don't ever grow in Christ until Christ becomes number one. And sometimes God's got to take us through this educational course where we're learning you can really trust God with your family and make those tough decisions in life and ministry that you may have to make. Well, so it was normal for Abraham to struggle with that. Let's look at the second thing. It's normal. It's normal for Christians to not know exactly where they are going when following God's will. It is normal for Christians to not know where exactly they are going when trying to follow God's will. Anybody identify with that? You're trying to follow God's will and you have absolutely no idea where he's taking you? And, and, and you're, you're begging him, Lord, please give me some insight, give me some direction, give me a road map. And it's like there's nothing well, that's normal. I hope you're encouraged by that. Look at Genesis 12, 6 through 9. So they get to the land, they set out for the land of Canaan. They arrive there. Abram travels through the land as far as the site of the great tree Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out, and he continued toward the Negev, which is just south of, of Israel, between Israel and Egypt. That's where uh, he's going to spend quite a bit of time. And you take that and you combine that with Hebrews 11, verse 8. Just look there very quickly. Hold your place in Genesis 12 and look at Hebrews 11, verse 8. And we get the commentary on his wanderings and on his travels. It says in verse 8 of Hebrews 11, By faith, Abram, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, and he obeyed, and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. Listen, a lot of the Christian life is not knowing where you are going. Sometimes it's not knowing where you've been either, okay? So once Abraham and his entourage finally begin heading for the land of Canaan, Abraham really has no specific, clear-cut idea of where exactly he's supposed to go, according to Hebrews 11.8. It's not like God gave him a road map and said, okay, now you go here, and, and you build yourself a house here, and you raise your, your family here, and, and then when Isaac's born, you're going to send him to college here, and then you're going to retire over here, and all that. He doesn't give him that road map. 
He just says, here's the land I want you to go to. It's yours. Now, Abraham probably would have been happy with 40 acres. He probably would have been happy with 40 acres and one son and a nice life. And God says, no, I'm going to give you a whole country. And in fact, I'm going to give you so many descendants, you can't even count, the, count them. There's going to be so many of them. God says, my vision for you, Abraham, is a whole lot bigger than your vision for you. And so Abraham has got this staggering vision of what God wants to do in his life, but he has no idea how it's supposed to work out practically on the ground. And apparently Abraham is okay with this. He's okay with this. And that's a mark of a growing faith. He's okay with this. He's, he's not stressing over this. Now, obviously, God knows where he's guiding Abraham. But Abraham doesn't know, and he can't know for the simple reason that none of us can ever see God's plan for us ahead of time. None of us. It's not allowed. Probably scare you to death anyway. None of us can ever see God's plan for us ahead of time of time. And so when we become consumed with knowing every step, every turn, every possibility, and every outcome of God's plan for our lives, we're no longer trusting God, we're just trusting our information. When, when, when a church has to make a decision and they say, boy, this is going to be a tough decision. We've got to make this decision. But what's going to happen if we make that decision? Well, guess what? You might not know that. And what's going to happen shouldn't impact the decision anyway. Not if we know what God wants us to do, right? So Abraham doesn't get the information. He's okay with this. And quite frankly, faith isn't found in trying to discover all the information about our future. Rather, it's trusting the God who promises to lead us and be with us in our future. So Abraham follows God step by step with limited information, going only as far as he can see God leading him. And then he stops and he sets up an altar to the Lord and he waits for further instructions. That's what he does. Step by step, he just goes to the land. Goes as far as he can see, as the Lord's told him, sets up an altar, he worship, he prays, he calls upon the name of the Lord, and he waits for instructions, and then he'll go a little bit further. I think there's an important principle here when we're trying to pursue God's will for our lives. When you can't see very far, go as far as you can see. And God will meet you there. When you can't see very far, go as far as you can see. And if you've gone as far as God wants you to go, he'll meet you at the next place. And, and this isn't abnormal. It's, it's really the experience of all believers as we journey through life on our way to our promised land. And, and, and while it sometimes appears as though we're wandering through life without plan or purpose, and keep in mind, when you track the life, life of Abraham, it does appear as though, there's, as though there's no plan or purpose. When you, when you track most of the people in the Bible, it appears as though there's no plan or purpose. It, it appears as though God likes circles. He just likes taking you in circles. And that's probably because he says you didn't learn it the first time. We're going to go back and hit you again until you finally get it. So I got a plaque on my office wall. Puts it really well. Not all who appear to be wandering are lost. I like that. Number three, it's normal for Christians to have their faith tested when they commit to obeying God. It's normal for Christians to have their faith tested when they commit to obeying God. God. That is normal. Now, just for those of you that are writing this down and are looking a little worried, let me just give you the first one one more time. It's normal for Christians who want to obey God to struggle with putting God first. Okay, that's where we started. Number two, it's normal for Christians to not know exactly where they are going when following God's will. 
And number three, it's normal for Christians to have their faith tested when they commit to obeying God. So, now here's Abraham. He's committed to obeying the Lord. He's committed to following Him fully by faith. It's not perfect obedience. It's not perfect faith. He's already screwed up a number of times. But, But he's on the road. He's on the trajectory. He's on the path of obedience, wanting to follow the Lord. And so he's made this commitment to heaven knows where, in a land that he's never been, not knowing where in the world he's going, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a trial that threatens to undo him. Look at Genesis 12, 10, the first part. Now. Now, so that's a transitional word in Hebrew, shows up in English as now, now. So in other words, God's saying, okay, now I want you to catch this change of scenes right here, because look what we're going to do. We're going to throw something into the path. Now, there was a famine in the land. There's a famine in the land. Now, most of us have never experienced famine, so that really doesn't hit us too hard. Most of us haven't been to places in Africa that have been hit with a famine, and you see the results of famine. And you are staggered beyond belief at what not having food does to human beings for years, to whole populations. And so Abraham is in a tough predicament, and this is very serious. And here's the reason why. It's not just Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is leading hundreds of people by now. In fact, we know this because in Genesis 14, 14, when he's got to go rescue Lot, who has been kidnapped by some enemy kings, Abram goes ahead and he raises up an army from among his own people that numbers over 300 soldiers. These are part of his people. So he's got a lot of people with him. Hundreds of people are in this entourage, okay? Probably why God said, you know, you ought to leave some of these things at home. And he's got thousands of animals. Thousands of animals. We see in the next chapter, uh, chapter 13, that Abraham and Lot actually have to separate because their animals are too much for the land. So, listen, when you've got hundreds of people to feed and thousands of animals to feed, a famine is serious business. You've got to find food. So there's a lot of pressure on Abraham here as he has committed to following God and he never saw a famine coming. Never saw that cancer coming. Never saw that loss of a job. Never saw that. Right before I was going to retire, I never saw that coming. Never saw the death of my wife or my husband coming that soon. I I never, ever thought that I would be injured in such a way that I couldn't do the job I wanted to do. I I never saw this. I never saw that. We never see those things coming, do we? But they come. And here it comes right after Abraham is committed to following God fully. And we've been there. We decide to obey the Lord. We, we decide that we're going to follow him doing something that is big. We've perhaps never done this before. We're going to involve ourselves in a ministry. We're going to give extra this month in, or for the rest of the year. We're going to do something that's going to call us to greater faith. And, and we get started with that. And then, boom, out of the blue, something smacks us that we never saw coming. Well, this is where Abraham is at, and it's normal. Listen, don't forget, it is normal for us to have our faith tested when we decide on a course of action which is going to require great faith and trust in God. That is normal. And the reason why it's normal is because before we can venture out in great faith and confidence, God needs to reveal to us how weak our faith and our confidence really is So that instead of trusting in our faith, we will trust in God. You see, some Christians are trusting in their faith, not in God. 
They're trusting in their capabilities, not in God. And God says, I, I'm, I'm glad for your, your desire to serve me in such a great way. I'm, I'm so glad you want to follow me into this risky situation with great faith. But the first thing I'm going to have to do is show you just how weak your faith is. And that you can't trust your faith. You know, when I've shared that story. When we went to Africa, we've never had so many trials in all our life. I mean, we just, remember the day we were just wondering, Lord, did we just miss all the signals? I mean, everything has gone wrong. Everything's gone wrong. And the Lord very kindly, through his word, says to us, no, nothing's gone wrong. Everything's going according to plan. But you've got to learn to trust me, not your faith. And there's a huge difference. Number four, we're almost done. Number four, it's normal for Christians to doubt God when afraid and take matters into their own hands. It's normal for Christians to doubt God when afraid and take matters into their own hands. We come to Genesis 12 and the second part of verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live. Bad move. God did not tell him to go to Egypt. God said, you go to Canaan, that's the land I am giving you. And at the first sign of trouble, what's he want to do? I'm heading for Egypt. I'm taking matters into my own hands because obviously God forgot about this part of the plan or did not inform me. So we're going to take matters into our own hands. We're going to fix this dog on it. Right? Listen, I'll tell you what, we can fix this. We can handle this. This isn't too big for us. I mean, we got like a couple hundred politicians in Washington that are saying that, right? We can fix this. My word, it's, well, the whole country's going over Niagara Falls. We can fix this. That's human nature, isn't it? That, that, that's, where, that's what we all do on different scales. So Abraham... Instead of trusting God at the first sign of trouble, heads for Egypt. And whenever you see in the Bible people going down to Egypt, you see that phrase, they went down to Egypt to live, unless God tells them to do that. And there's one case when he does, when he tells Joseph and Mary, take Jesus down to Egypt. But if God didn't, doesn't tell you to go to Egypt, don't go to Egypt, okay? Because that is making the point that you think you've got a better chance of surviving the test of faith by taking matters into your own hands rather than by trusting God. And Abraham's logic is fatally flawed, fatally flawed, because it's driven by fear rather than faith in God. And the Bible tells us in Romans 14, 23, that whatever we do that is not of faith is what? Sin. Listen, if you're driven by anything other than believing God and His promises and trusting Him, you are in sin. So if fear is your motive for what you're doing, it's sin. Okay? Plain, plain and simple. If you're making decisions out of fear, you are operating with a faulty motive, and you are actually in sin. We as believers don't need to make decisions based on fear. We make them based on faith in God, who has given us his promises. But here's the, pro the problem. Many of us don't read the Bible enough to know what the promises are. We just got a little Christian coloring books. And we just look, oh, there's a little promise right there. I'll hold on to that one. You know why we have weak Christians? Because we don't read this much. We don't study this much. Again, we watch too much TV. We need to be in the Word of God so we know the promises of God. Whenever we choose to make decisions out of fearful urgency rather than out of a calm faith in God, we will end up in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing, and for all the wrong reasons. And this is pretty normal for most believers when we find ourselves between a rock and a hard place, isn't it? We struggle with trusting and waiting upon God when we could be taking matters into our own hands and fixing things, or so we think. So, Abraham ends up coming up with a plan that, that really damages his integrity with Pharaoh 
his integrity with his wife, and more importantly, displeases God. He goes into Egypt, and we don't have time to read the whole story. You can read it later. But he realizes once he gets to Egypt that the Egyptians are going to notice that his wife is really pretty, and they're going to want his wife. Pharaoh's going to say, hey, I like that woman. I want her to be part of my harem. And to be part of a harem means that she will eventually have her turn to spend the night with Pharaoh. And so Abraham is saying, listen, in order to spare my life, I want you to tell everybody that you're my sister. And she was his half-sister. He said, I want you to tell me you're my sister. We're not married, and, and that'll save my life. Well, man, where Abraham, what in the world are you doing? Are you nuts? And it ends up, God intervenes, inflicts Pharaoh's household with, with serious diseases. Pharaoh realizes these diseases started when I brought that woman into my harem. God protects Sarah. And he disciplines Abraham. He humiliates him in front of the whole Egyptian nation. His integrity is ruined. It is shot. Not only with this nation of people that are watching this guy, but what does his wife think about him? And finally, they're kicked out of Egypt. And this was God's discipline in Abraham's life. Humiliation, dishonor, and shame. You look down here, uh, verse 20, the Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men. They sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had for what he had done in deceiving them and causing them to almost commit great grievous sin against the Lord. The last principle, we'll finish with this, number five, it's normal for Christians to repent Begin again and experience God's smile. Now, understand, Abraham has just committed a, a very, very terrible thing. I mean, he has basically given up his wife to be with another man to save his own skin. I, we, we, we take a guy out there and tar and feather him for that, right? Do worse to him for that. Or we used to. We would used to do something with that stuff like that. I mean, this is bad. And, and you would think, man, what's Abraham going to do now? I mean, he's really upset God. Well, look what he does. Genesis 13, 1 through 4. So Abraham went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife. I'm sure that that was not a very really joyful trip with his wife. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they were not holding hands. And everything he had, and Lot went with him. There's Lot still hanging on. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. I mean, Pharaoh gave him a whole bunch of stuff. Get out of here. Here's your stuff. They, I mean, the Israelites are fleecing Egypt all kinds of ways here and then later, 400 years later. Verse 3, from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. He gets up. He leaves Egypt with his tail between his legs. Totally humiliated. Dishonored. And shamed. And he retraces his steps exactly. Back to Beth El. Which means the house of God where he calls upon the name of the Lord in worship and for forgiveness. And he does this because it's normal for true believers, once they realize they have sinned, to finally repent. Listen, if, if you profess faith in Christ and you are involved in sin, and you are involved in all kinds of, of, of things that you shouldn't do, and you never, ever repent. You're never brought to repentance. Do you know what that means? It means you're not a true believer. It's normal for true believers to repent. It's normal for us to sin grievously. But when we do, and when God brings us to account, it's normal for us to run back to God. Mentioned Wednesday night, what's the difference between a pig and a sheep when they fall into a mud hole? The pig wants to stay. 
the sheep wants out and wants to get clean. It's normal for true believers, once they realize they've sinned, to finally repent, retrace their steps back to the place where God wants them to be, and begin worshiping, following, and serving again. Listen, true faith will normally drive believers back to square one. Once they realize they have sinned and are in need of God's forgiveness, and again, if it doesn't do that, it's not true faith. And who does Abraham find waiting for him when he goes back to the house of God? Who who is there waiting for him at Bethel? Well, guess what? He found the God whose plan for Abraham could not be ruined by Abraham's lack of faith and disobedience. Abraham doesn't ruin the plan because you can't ruin God's plan. We don't have enough power to do that. God is still sovereign even in our sin. And so he found the God who still had the plan for Abraham. And he found the God who is rich in mercy and who takes great pleasure in forgiving, restoring, and lifting up the head of the believer who has fallen into shame. Do you know the Bible says, who is the lifter of our head? It's Jesus. God lifts our head. We fall, we sin, we are ashamed, and God forgives, he restores, and he comes, and he lifts up our head. Aren't you glad? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Abraham. And Father, we thank you that what we see in him is a life that looks a lot like ours. And we're thankful for that. But we also see that in his life that there was repentance when he sinned. And realized he had sinned. And Father, I pray that as we look at our lives, that we would see the repentance. We would see that there is a desire to always return to you when we have sinned, to always be clean, to be cleansed, to be restored to fellowship. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.